uh, last uh, few weeks, I've been ministering here at the church about how to detect uh, deception. I run into a lot of people that are believers that have been deceived and they've lost their joy. They've lost their strength and vibrancy. And I just really believe that as we begin to look at the word about this topic, that God will begin to show us areas that the devil's trying to get into our lives to steal from us and to cheat from us. Amen. But I want to start with this point, and that is this. The more that you can be in a state of expectancy for the things of God, the less the devil will be able to get into your life. Listening to me? Now imagine this, if you would. Imagine if Jesus appeared today in the service and he told us all that in 40 days he was coming back. 40 days. Now we know that no one can know the day or the hour. We know that. But just for an illustration's sake, bear with me. Amen? So we know that in 40 days... The Lord is going to come back. Now, what are you going to do then? Well, I'll tell you what would happen. These altars would be full. You would be uh, getting yourself right with God because there's no longer any time to put it off. Amen? And you would be going out and you would be winning as many people to Jesus as possible Especially loved ones. You'd be begging them. You'd be going to them and saying, man, you have got to come to Jesus. He's coming back and we don't want you to go through the great tribulation. We, we don't want you to suffer and, and really be threatened with the sign of the beast and all that stuff. We want you safe. You need to come to Jesus. 1 John chapter 3, verse 2 says this. says that if we have this hope, that that hope itself would purify us even as we are pure. In other words, when you are in that state of expecting God's word to be fulfilled in your life, man, you're, 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 you're in your game, you're in your mode, you're in, your, you're in that place where we're where deception doesn't have a foothold. But when we have put off changing, put off our commitment, put off our seal, put off whatever it is in your life, then you're in a place that you can be deceived. Amen? So keep expecting. No matter what it is from God that you're believing God for, keep expecting it in your life. Keep uh, looking for it. Keep your faith out on it, and then you'll be in a place where you'll keep yourself in a, in a defensive mode where the devil cannot come in and deceive you. Look with me over to Luke's Gospel, chapter um, 18, verse 1, and look, 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 what, look what it says here in the Gospels. Luke 18, verse 1. Then, then he spoke parable to them. Men always ought to pray. Say men always ought to pray. Now, ladies, you can put yourself there too. And not to lose heart. Say not lose heart. <laughs> now, in the word, we discover that to lose heart means that you give up. You throw in the towel. Uh, you just say... Uh, It's not happening. I quit. That's it. That's what it means to lose heart. The psalmist said this. He said, I would have lost heart if I had not believed that I would see the goodness of God in the land of the living. In other words, I would have given up if I stopped. If I stopped believing that God would come through in this life and help me. Amen. Help me pay my bills. Help me with my physical problems. Help me with my family problems. If I had stopped believing, I would have lost heart. Lost heart. Man, you got to see that, church. See, you remember, see, this is the key to overcoming deception. 
Uh, if you don't have joy, you're going to be susceptible. If you're down and out and just upset and really in that downward spiral of just being ungrateful and all that, you will be a target of deception when you're like that in your life. Um, let me say it to you in this way, and maybe this will help in a great way. Jesus said this the, the night before he, his death and resurrection. He told his disciples, said this, he said, in that day, talking about after the resurrection, he said, in that day, you will, ask, whatever you ask in my name, I will do it for you. And he said that, that whatever you ask will be done in order that your joy would be made full. Now, in other words, as a believer, I got joy. Amen? But that joy is only made full when my prayers are being answered. Amen? Amen. So if we quit praying, we quit believing, if we quit seeking God, if we quit believing that God will come through in the way that he said he would come through, if we quit doing that in our lives, church, uh, we're going to lose heart and we're not going to have joy that is made full in our lives. We need to live in a state where God is continually bringing prayer to pass in our lives and our joy is being made full and the more full it is, the less the devil can get in because the more happy you are, the more thankful you are, the more excited you are, come on, and deception can't get in when your joy is being made full. Amen. Hallelujah. But you may have been in a church that said, wow, God doesn't always do, do what you want him to do in the word. Sometimes he says yes, sometimes he says no, and sometimes he says wait. Church, the Bible's clear that when we pray according to his will, that it is yes and amen in Christ. It's not yes and no. It is yes and amen. Come on, yes and amen. Let it be so. It is our right to believe and expect that God would come through and answer our prayers, that our joy would be made full, that we would not give up, but we would persevere and we would seek God and we'd say, God, no matter what, I'm going to praise you and thank you, Lord, for what is coming in my life. And then when it comes, our joy is made full and we are full of even more thankfulness than what we already have in our lives, which is so thankful. Amen? Hallelujah, church. See, they didn't, they, they, they replaced that part of their walk that was irreplaceable. They replaced it with probably good things, but you can't live with God without knowing him personally. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah, church. Now, it says that if you do this, if you repent, I will give you access into the tree of life, which is in the midst of the garden. Wow. The word there for overcome, it is a present act participle which means it is a continual action if you now continually make God the center of your source of life and seek him and get his is inside on your life then I'm going to give you access to the tree of life which is in the midst of the garden and the tree of life is represented in scripture and proverbs as wisdom, number one, Proverbs three sixteen, And that wisdom will give you long life and it will extend the length or, and it also will give you wealth and honor. Hallelujah. 
Plus, tree of life is the ability to lead people to Jesus. Hallie, it's also in Proverbs. And last, not least, hope deferred makes the heart sick, but desire fulfilled is a what? Tree of life. In other words, get close with God, and then God will begin to fulfill the desires in your life that are good. And your joy will be made full. And your joy will be happy. And come on, you'll be full of joy in your life. It's awesome. It's awesome, church. See, the devil cannot deceive you or successfully deceive you if you keep your joy level up and if you keep a strong relationship with God in your life because he becomes your source, not other people. Let me show you how this uh, works in the church. Devil wants to mislead you. So he sends a would-be prophet. I believe that God wants you to sell your house and move to Texas. If you don't know God, you may think that God is speaking to you. And you'll sell your house and you'll move and go, whoa, how come God's not blessing me now? What's wrong? See, 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 you were honest, but you were deceived because did not rely on your relationship with God. He did not say, Lord, here's what the man of God said. But is it of you? Is it of you? Is it really what you want me to do in my life? Hallelujah. And if the Lord bears witness in your heart, it's right, then do it. But if you don't have that relationship... And you let everyone else determine what God's will is in your life. You're going to run into trouble. Big trouble. Amen? Amen. All right. For those references, Proverbs 3, verse 16 and 18. Proverbs 13 and 12. And uh, Proverbs 11 and 30. Now, let me begin to wind this message down a little bit today. Said a little bit. I'm on the approach to the runway, but it's still a little ways off, okay? I'm on the approach. Uh, when you play tennis with someone, when you do it, you don't start out hitting the ball and going for the score. What you do is you volley for a while. You knock the ball back and forth, and uh, you begin to learn uh, what your opponent does, his weaknesses and his strengths when you volley. Hit away in the back, and he's slow to get to, and you go, all right, he's not quick. But he's got a murderous serve. So you learn that, and then when the game starts... You use that knowledge that you learned when you were following with him how to beat him. Amen? See, here's what the devil will do in our lives. He, he will take our weaknesses and our strengths, and he'll use them as an opportunity to defeat us. You know what I'm talking about But when I say that? In other words, let's say this. Jesus said this. Jesus said, you need to love me more than a human relationship in your life. Isn't that what the Lord said? Can't really be my disciple unless you love me that much. So here's what happens. You're a Christian, but your kids mean a whole lot to you more than they should. In other words, you'll... uh, Sometimes put them above your relationship with God. You love them that much. So what does the devil do? He will stir up as much trouble as he possibly can with your kids. You know why? He knows 
that if he give them to fall, you'll fall with them. Amen? It may start out with sports. Sports on Sunday. And you do it and you do it and you go, well, it's for the better of the child. Whatever. But what you don't realize is the devil's trying to take out your children and in the process he's trying to take you out. And so your kids learn that hey, it's all right to put things before God and then when they get married and move out, they fall away from the faith. And so do you. Come on now, don't shout me down because that's really, really good preaching. It is good. Or how about this one? Your marriage, your wife, your husband. Well, he really wants to go fishing on Sunday, and I love him. You know what the devil will do? He will target your husband and give him all kinds of opportunities to miss church. And he will filter into him every conceivable deception for one reason. To destroy him and you because you're following him when he's disobeying God. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. See the Lord, he knew what he was doing when he said, listen, you want to be my disciple? I got to be first. Above yourself, above your loved ones, got to be first. You know, I know people that uh, haven't gotten saved because of that. They haven't gotten saved. I know people that their uh, loved one died without Jesus. And the Bible says that when you die without the Lord, you go to hell. And they won't get saved now. You know why? I love them so much that if God sent them to hell, I'm going there with them. I'm not going to serve God if he's that kind of God. I met people like that. How about this one? How many know people in the church that are no longer really committed to God because they admired someone in the church, a preacher, a whatever, and they fell and they said this, well, if they can't keep the faith, then it's no sense for me trying. And they threw it in. See, they, they came on the false pretense. They exalted a person above Jesus and were deceived. 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 See, now, now catch this. This is important. When Jesus was uh, being tempted on the mount with the devil, the devil told him, he said, listen, if you, he took him up to the temple and he said, jump off this and your angels will catch you. Remember that? And, uh, and, uh, and, and, and the Lord said, you know, and the Lord wouldn't do it. Why? Because he knew very clearly what was right and what was wrong. Because see, he wasn't deceived. See, the first Adam was not deceived. It was only, it was only his descendants. Are you listening to me? Jesus did not have the sin nature, so he couldn't be deceived. He could be tempted, but not deceived. Everything was uh, black and white, no gray. So when the devil took him up on the mount and he showed him the glory on a mountain and he showed him all the glories of the world. And he said, uh, all of this can be yours if you bow down and worship me. Well, that's not much of a deception, is it? I mean, he's making it very clear. You know, here's what you got to do. See, see, here's the part you need to get hold of. 
We are to run to Jesus because everything is black and white to Jesus. It's either right or it's wrong. There's no gray areas. It's either right or it's wrong. And he can fix it. Amen? Amen. Now, now, let me explain where I'm going with this. Any time in your life you have a gray area in your life where you're not sure if it's right or wrong, don't do it. Any gray area is an area that you can be deceived in. If it's clear, you can be deceived. Only when it's gray. Only when it's gray. See, Romans 14 says that don't do anything if you're doubting at all. Anything that is of doubt is not of faith and is sin. So here's a warning. This will help you. Whatever you're facing in your life, whether big or small, if you're not sure if it's right or wrong, stay away from it. Seek God until you know if it's right. As long as it's gray, you're in trouble. You'll never be deceived in an area that is black and white. You'll always be deceived in an area that is gray. So we got to make sure that we don't allow that grayness in our lives. Well, Lord, I'm not sure if I should marry that person because, you know, they're an unbeliever. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. The word says clearly not to. It's black and white. But what if the word doesn't say clearly about it? Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Just don't do it. But I really want to do it. I really want to do it. If it's gray, don't do it. Don't do it. And you'll prevent yourself from stumbling. I've had many people come to me and they go, Pastor, I'm not sure if I should do this, but I'm going to do it. I always say, listen, if you're not sure, wait until you are sure. And if you don't get sure, then don't do it. It works that way. Amen. Amen. See, church, please listen to me when I say this. You are called to win in life. You can't win in life if you're deceived. You can't win in life because the devil will trick you. He'll trick you out of your blessing. He'll take you from the people that God wants you to be with to the people that God doesn't want you to be with. He will deceive you. He will undermine you. He will destroy you in any way possible that he can through deception. So don't allow any, any, any gray areas in your life. Just avoid it all together. Amen. Amen. On behalf of Jack and Joyce, we want to say thank you for supporting our ministry. When in the Seattle area, we invite you to join us for services at the River, Sundays at 9 a.m., 11 a.m., and 6 p.m., and Wednesdays at 7 p.m. Thanks again for watching, and join us next week at the River.